Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our online service here at Pompey Community Church. My name's Wendell. I'm the lead pastor here at the church, and I'm so happy that you have chose to be a part of our worship service this morning. As I was getting ready to uh, think about what I might say as an introduction, the Psalm, uh, Psalm 133, the first verse jumped into my mind, and it says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people dwell together or live together in unity. And we can't be together in the building, of course, but we sure can dwell together, join together in our worship as we gather this morning. Our God is worthy of our praise. We need to be with each other, even if it's through technology. And uh, my prayer and my desire this morning is that we would bring praise to God and honor to him. Our lives would be changed and we become a little bit more like Jesus because of our time together. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me as we uh, start our service. Heavenly Father, thank you for the beauty of this day, a day that you've given to us, a day that we woke up, had breath in our lungs, a day that you knew about from eternity past. Our desire as we gather this morning is to lift your name up, to bring worship, our worship to you so that you would be glorified and honored. And Father, we know that is your will for us. So would you bless our service, help everything to flow together, open our minds so that we might be challenged to uh, make the changes that we need to or be encouraged because we're doing the things that we are. So we love you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray, amen. Well, great. Let's uh, join our voices together in worship right now. Well, good morning. Let's get ready to worship together. Breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, then leaves his breath dead. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. sing for all that you've done for me who brings our chaos back into order who makes the orphan the son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory the nations with truth and justice shine like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is a failing Who 
Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain
Well, thank you so much for leading us in worship. Let's just take a minute now and go to the Lord in prayer. So with every head bowed and every eyes closed, let's just lift up the Lord in praise. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you so much for your mercy that you show us every single day, Lord. Your blessings are overflowing, God, and we're so grateful, Lord. I pray that we would have eyes to see these magnificent uh, gifts that you have put in our life, Lord. I just want to lift up to you and pray uh, for all the leadership right now, Lord. I pray for our country. I pray for our nation, Lord. I pray for those who have to make the very difficult decisions, Lord. Would you give them wisdom and guidance and counsel, Lord? I pray for our local leaders, Lord. I pray that you would help us to uh, discern correctly what it is that we should do as things begin to slowly reopen lord we need your wisdom we need your guidance lord and god i also want to just lift up to you the healthcare workers and those who are working at the front lines of all of this lord just please be with them with your hand of protection rest upon them in this very difficult and trying times for not only them but their families and their friends god be with all of them god and finally lord we just want to give you praise and thanks for all of the wonderful uh, blessings that you have given to us here at PCC uh, and how uh, we have been able to bless other people but how others have been able to bless us and and shared with us um, uh, stories about how we can help other people in the community Lord we we love you and we praise you and we thank you for this time we give you all the glory in your name Jesus amen We bring a blessing now to the Father of our Savior, our one and living hope. Good morning, PCC Church family, friends, and those of you who are visiting us for the first time. My name is Josiah Durfee. I'm the new, uh, relatively new associate pastor. And I'm so glad that you are joining us as we continue our sermon series, Our One and Living Hope, where we look at the book of First Peter uh, verse by verse, and I am going to be picking up where we left off from last week. And I hope you really have enjoyed our worship with us this morning and you've been enjoying this, this study. I know God has definitely been teaching me so much in His Word through the book of First Peter. And so I'm just going to open us up with a quick word of prayer again and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you so much for this time that you have given us. Lord, would you give us attentive ears and attentive eyes, attentive hearts, to uh, hear your words so that we can respond to it appropriately in our lives, God. We thank you for this time, Lord, and we anticipate, we look forward to the day when we are gathered together, standing shoulders in shoulder um, and worshiping and praising the Lord with one voice. And uh, we're, we're glad that even now we can at least do this virtually, God, but um, we thank you and we praise you and we give you all the honor and glory in your name, Jesus. Amen. So this week I read a really interesting, kind of a funny story about a man who wanted to hang up a picture in his entryway that was uh, 30 feet high. He had ceilings that were 30 feet high. And he didn't have a ladder on him immediately. And so he did what any do-it-yourself man would do. He grabbed a chair and he pulled up the chair against the wall and he climbed up on top of that chair and he was still short of his goal where he wanted to place that nail. And so his wife went and grabbed him a box and so the man puts on top of the chair the box and he climbs up on top of that and he is still short so the man went goes and he grabs himself a stool and he climbs up upon his makeshift edifice and he is still short and so he grabs the thickest book uh, in his library and he stacks it up on top of the stool and he climbs up that edifice he builds very slowly and carefully and he can just barely reach where it is that he wants to place the nail. And he begins uh, tapping the nail very timidly uh, in that location. And down below, his wife cries out to him, what are you doing? You are never going to hit the nail in that way if you don't tap it hard enough. Well, the man who is precariously perched up, up on top of this makeshift ladder that he made 
looks down and he says, how can a man do anything up on such a shaky foundation? You know, we, that story is funny uh, for a lot of reasons because it, it tells us a very simple truth, which is that weak foundations are dangerous and precarious things to stand on. Whether that is a makeshift ladder or you're in a building where you know that there are severe cracks in the foundation. And the question that I want uh, us to be examining this morning as we look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1-10, through 10, which I'm about to read, is what is the foundation that you are building your life upon? Because whether or not you knew it this morning, you, you are building your life either on the foundation of, of steady, a firm foundation, or a shaky foundation. And today we're going to be examining two foundations and answering the question, what is the foundation that you are building your life upon? And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and take them and open them up with me to our passage, 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. The Word of God says this, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to Him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I'm going to do something a little different this morning than I usually do. We're going to actually pick up in verse 4, and I hope if I have enough time at the end, we're going to come back to verses 1 through 3, because we don't want to miss the, the wonderful and the beautiful truths that are in that passage there. But let's look at verse 4 as we talk about the different kinds of foundations that we can be building our life upon. In verse 4, Peter says this, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. Before we even talk about this ver verse, we have to answer a couple of questions. Number one, we have to know who is this living stone and, and who are these builders, who are these people who, is, who have rejected Jesus? Well, what Peter is doing here is he's actually hinting at a verse that he's about to quote in its entirety in verse 7, uh, which is Psalm 118, verse 22. And that actually becomes the criteria of which we are going to use to, to answer the questions, who is this living stone and who are these builders that rejected this living stone? Well, we don't have to guess, fortunately, who this living stone is because Jesus referred to himself as this living stone in all three synoptic gospels, quoting uh, this psalm, Psalm 118, verse 22. He says of himself, he was this stone that the builders rejected. That is who the living, living stone is. And so, who are the builders then? Who are, who are these, these builders? And the builders, Peter actually tells us in another sermon he preached in Acts chapter 4, verse 11, where he uses parts of this verse, Psalm 118, verse 22, uh, to point the finger at the people who crucified Jesus himself. Now, Paul also uses a similar passage in Romans chapter 9 to say that the ones who rejected Jesus um, was not just the people who crucified Jesus, but it was also the nation as a whole, the nation of Israel. If you remember in John chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, it says that Jesus came into this world and the world did not recognize him and he came to his own and they, did, and they rejected him. 
They rejected him. But who is Peter talking about in this context, in this epistle? Who are the builders who are rejecting Jesus? Well, he is clearly talking about, he is clearly talking about that those who are rejecting Jesus, he's using a much broader category than the people who crucified Jesus and the nation of Israel to say that all of those who have rejected Jesus, all of those who by their unbelief, have, who have not put their faith in Jesus Christ, are those who have rejected Jesus Christ. Which brings us very naturally into this question, which is this, that the Bible is absolutely clear about. There is no spiritual halfway house. There is no spiritual neutral zone. You are either building your life on the foundation of Jesus Christ, or you are building your life on the foundation of man. And we're going to talk about more about what that foundation is. But indecision is itself a decision. Uh, Billy Graham used to say, used to use this really great analogy. He'd say, if you had a ticket to Atlanta and the departure time was at six o'clock and you waited in the terminal trying to determine whether or not you wanted to go and you don't make a decision and you miss the departure time, then you have chosen as a result to not go. And, and you know, I hope this morning as we examine these two different foundations, these two different structures, that we would all examine our hearts so that we could be certain that we are building our life on the foundation of Jesus Christ himself. So I hope we examine our life because Peter comes to us like a home inspector, okay? So I've never bought a house, I don't own a house, but I know one of the critical things that you need to do of first importance if you're considering buying it is to get an inspector or hire out some contractor to come on site to examine the foundation of your house to see if the foundation is steady, if it is firm. And Peter is going to to be for us like that contractor as we examine these two different foundations, these two totally different um, structures, as we will see. Let's first talk about the foundation of man. So uh, in this context, there is, you know, if you were going to build a structure, what you would do is that you would have a team of builders who would cut the stone in the quarry and then you would also have a team of builders who would carry the stone from the quarry to the location where the building was being built. And once the stone, from what I understand, arrives on site, there would be another team of builders who would examine the stone. It's a pretty simple analogy that Peter is using here. And they would examine the stone and they would make a decision as to its value, as to whether or not it can be used either as the foundation or for its superstructure. Now, if you think of a building and what stones could be used for, it could be used, yeah, it could be used for the foundation, it could be used for its steps, it could be used maybe for the ceiling and its walls. And when these builders looked at Jesus, this living stone, when they examined him, they looked at his words. They looked at his miracles. They looked at the blind man that Jesus restored sight to in John chapter 9. They looked at the deaf man that he restored uh, hearing to in Mark 7. They looked at the demon-possessed man in Mark chapter 5. They looked even at the cross, the empty tomb, the resurrection of Jesus himself, and they determined that he was completely useless. That's what it does mean. They rejected him. They put him aside. He wasn't even worthy to be the steps of this edifice that these, these people were building. And we know this because in we, we see in Luke chapter 11 that some people, when Jesus would perform a miracle, they would say that he does this by the power of the prince of Beelzebub, the prince of, of demons. As I've already said in John chapter 110, the people, the world did not recognize them and his own people rejected him. Now notice the contrast here. Because I've just read this passage and because most of us really, you know, we know this passage, we already have it preloaded in our mind what is about to be said. But the contrast here is quite significant here because while the, these men who are building their structure 
uh, deemed this stone is completely useless for their building. It says here that God looked at this stone and he says it was chosen and precious. It is far beyond useless. In fact, it is the most valuable stone of all. And we later learn that it is the cornerstone. Now, most of us might not know what a cornerstone is, and that is usually the first stone that is set in the construction of a masonry foundation. And all other stones would be set in reference to this stone, thus determining the entire structure. God looks at this and says, this is the most valuable stone. In Ephesians 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 20, Paul actually tells us that this foundation, this, this stone of which Jesus Christ sits upon, is the stone on which all of Christianity and all of our faith rests upon. It says in 2, verse 19 in Ephesians, um, So when you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, listen here, verse 20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, and listen to this, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by his spirit. The entire Christian faith rests upon this, this cornerstone and everything else fits in alignment with who Jesus is. But notice here that I've never, I haven't answered the question yet as to what, is, what makes up the foundation of man. Well, the interesting thing is in this passage, we are never actually told what that is because I think in many ways, because Peter was a disciple of Jesus, he knew what Jesus taught on this. And he said that the foundation of man is sand itself. In Matthew chapter 7, it says this in verse 24, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Verse 26, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall uh, and great was the fall of it. You know, I don't have to go into this very much because most of us know as children, we used to go to the beach with our little sand castle shaped buckets. And how many of you were so impressed at the end of building the most, the, the coolest castle with, a, with the biggest moat around it, only to find the next day that somebody's foot had crashed through it and completely destroyed it. He is saying, what First Peter is saying is that whatever the foundation of man is, is Jesus says it's, the foundation is sand, but whatever that is, it is fragile, it is weak, and it cannot sustain anything of meaning and purpose. And I just want you to see this contrast for what it really is. Because on the one structure, you have the foundation who is God himself, right? Who is intrinsically meaningful, he is uncreated. And you have on this other hand, uh, the foundation of man, which is something created, something that man has to assign meaning and purpose and find in, in this natural world. And I feel like as your pastor, that in, in many ways, I would be irresponsible if I didn't communicate this to you. I think in no other time than the time that we are living in right now with so many unanswered questions that we have in the uncertainty and in light of this virus, that what God is teaching us, for most of us, some of us, is the weaknesses of the foundations that we have been building our life upon. Now, where do I get that? Look with me in verse 6. It says this, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Peter here is a quoting Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. And in this context, we learn that the northern kingdom has already been taken away by the Babylonians. They've been taken captive and they've been dispersed all over the Babylonian empire. And the southern part of Israel is next. And, and they feel Jerusalem feels their imminent danger and they 
are in fear that they are going to be taken captive. And it says in this context that the priests themselves were dr became overcome with drunk and, and of, of strong wine and, and all these other things, and they've become unteachable. They, they can't teach knowledge, and they have made a refuge of lies. And then it also tells us that they have made a covenant with death. Now, what is that covenant? Most people believe it is a, a, a covenant that the Israelites made with the Egyptian empire, and they were depending upon, listen to this carefully, the Israelites were depending upon the Israel, or the Israelite nation was depending on, excuse me, the Egyptian empire to be their means of comfort, security, and dependence to protect them from the Babylonian empire. Well, we know that the Babylonian Empire comes, the Egyptians weren't able to protect them, and the Israelites ended up being dispersed all across uh, the, uh, the nation of Babylon. And just as they have become so dependent on these things, I believe in this time and in, this, in the life that we have now, what God is teaching us and showing us is the weaknesses and the foundations that we have. I mean, most of us, uh, some of us, I should say, excuse me, have lost our jobs. And I, I say this with all uh, sincerity of heart and compassion. I know this is not easy, but maybe what God is teaching us and He is showing us is that we have been relying on our jobs and our financial security in a way that has replaced God for who He is. We've been relying on these things to provide us things that the Bible says only God can provide for us. Some of us have lost social capital too. We can't hang out with our friends as often as we would prefer and as often as we'd like to. And you know, we can't go to work and have that social life there. And as a result of losing that, God might be teaching us probably the weaknesses of finding our meaning and our purpose in these things that we were never intended to find our our meaning and purpose. And it tells us in verse 7 as to whether or not you accept Jesus as your cornerstone, as your firm foundation. He has indeed been made this cornerstone. Look at here. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And in verse 8, this stone will um, either be a rock of your salvation or a stumbling block, a rock of offense here when he quotes Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14. So the question I ask again is, who are you building your life upon? Are you building your life on the foundation of Jesus Christ himself, or are you building your life on the foundation of man? So I want us to just transition and look at the benefits, one of the and the blessings of what Christ gives us when we give our life to him and when we are building our life on his foundation. Number one, look with me in the text. It says that we share a similar nature with Jesus Christ. It says that you yourselves, like living stones, he's saying that just as Christ is a living stone, we too are a living stone. Paul says in Romans 6, just as we have experienced a death like his, we will also experience a life like his. We will also be resurrected and not go through the second death. Paul says that uh, the message of the cross is folly for those who are perishing, but for those who are being saved, it is the salvation of men. We are given the same nature of as Christ. And he also tells us that we are given, you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that we are given the mind of Christ. Think about how that helps us navigate the world that we live in. God gives us a moral and ethical framework to interpret the world that we live in. And he, by consequence, gives us an entire worldview, a grid work in which to perceive uh, the world that we live in. But it also tells us it also defines for us, excuse me, our relationship with other believers. If we as believers, as Christians who profess Jesus as their Lord and Savior, are like living stones being built together, uh, we are not stones who are left in an empty field. We haven't been left uh, in some heap pile 
you know, somewhere in the middle of nowhere, but we have a purpose and a meaning, a significance given to us by God himself. If you remember ever putting together a jigsaw puzzle piece, you know, maybe you've had some time during this uh, lockdown to, to put together some puzzles, you know, of any kind of size, 5,000 pieces. Have you ever gotten to the end of a puzzle and you can't find that one single piece and it's one of the most annoying things? You begin to think that your puzzle is defective, that the manufacturers forgot that one piece, but then you find it on your, your, your couch. And that's because that piece has a very specific purpose and design to it. And what Peter's telling us is that each of us are like living stones being built together. Furthermore, this passage speaks to the unity that we have in Christ, the unity that we have in Christ. The church is unlike any other institution in the world because Christ transforms our nature and he makes us more into who he is. And so we are united with the same goals, the same purposes, the same direction, the same intentions. And I want to close just with one story. I remember I had this really good friend that... Um, uh, of mine uh, who I was born and raised with and we used to do everything together we used to bike together we used to run together it was really all, you know a really great friendship and I'm so grateful for him in my life and I knew him for my entire childhood well um, eventually I graduated from Chittenango High School and I moved it down to Fort Worth and there I met some people there who became instantly uh, friends of mine over such a short period of time and I couldn't figure out why that was you know here I had this really good friend of mine who I knew my entire life and I didn't feel as close as I did to these people I'd met who later now become some of my best friends because him and I my friend and I in high school didn't share the same inner convictions and the same unity of, of mind and the same desires and, and, and loves that I had with other Christian brothers and sisters that I had in, in Jesus, Jesus Christ. And so I know we haven't gotten to a significant part of these passage here this morning, but I am running out of time this morning. But I want you all just to think about, I will go back and uh, next week and we'll look at these passages. But I want you just this week, just examine your heart and ask yourself, who and what foundation are you building your life upon? Well, we thank you guys for joining us. We hope you have a great week. We love you and we're praying for you. And we hope, yeah, we hope you have a great week. God bless y'all. Bye. Well, Josiah, uh, thank you so, so very much for sharing God's word with us. I have been loving our study through the book of 1 Peter and uh, look forward to all the new things that I'm going to learn as long as, uh, as well as all of us are going to learn together. I'm so grateful for God's word and the difference it makes. I pray that we're a little different as we prayed in the beginning, that we're a little bit more like Jesus because of, because of all we've experienced today. Uh, before we close, I just want to share a great big praise, and probably the majority of the people at PCC already know this, but our dear friend Mary Rapp received her new kidney this week, and it is functioning wonderfully, and both her and her donor, which is her brother-in-law Stevie, are, are doing well. And uh, so I encourage us just to praise the Lord for God's faithfulness through uh, keeping them safe, guiding the doctor's hands. And I want to encourage all of us to continue to pray for a speedy recovery for both of them. So I just wanted to just share that and encourage us to just give thanks. Um, if you've not subscribed to our PCC YouTube channel yet, or if you've not liked us on Facebook yet, would you please do that? It really is just a great way for us to get our, our, our services spread a little more out so people can hear all that's going on. I also encourage you, if you've not been to our webpage, that you go there as well because everything you need to know if you have any kind of questions about what's happening throughout the week or uh, any of the different things that are happening you will find it there so just go to pompeychurch.org and uh, you can find that also just remember you can always call the church and uh, leave a prayer request you can leave a request to talk to somebody or pray with someone we would uh, really consider it a real privilege to be able to do that with you so again thanks for being a part of our service be the hands, feet, and voice of Jesus. Look for ways to let his love shine through your lives. And uh, thank you again. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week.